Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And um, we're just going to give it about 30 seconds then before we make a start with today's session. Um, just let everyone enter the virtual room. Uh, and yes, we'll make a start in about 30 seconds then. Brilliant. Well, welcome everyone. And, well, good afternoon then, and welcome to uh, Crossroad Partnership's 16th and final live share session of our series. Uh, I hope you're all keeping very well. Um, my name is Thomas Joyce. I work here at Crossroad Partnership, and over the next hour or so, we'll be discussing the future functionality and potential of London centres, providing a deeper insight into what London might start to look and feel like as we emerge from this pandemic. Uh, but before we do make a start, uh, I would just like to go through a few bits of housekeeping. So this live chat session is being recorded and will be available to view online. Like always, we'll signpost you to the link for this at the end of the event. Uh, also, I know that you'll be able to see that there's just one person watching and you might be thinking, is it only me? Please don't worry, you're not alone. And I can assure you that there is more than one person uh, on the session today. Um, it's also worth mentioning uh, that we'd love for you to see our lovely faces, but to ensure smooth experience, we're going to keep to our headshots for this session. And on the note to smooth experience, do make sure you've logged on via Google Chrome as the live share platform works best using this browser. Just a little bit of tech wizardry then as well for you all. Um, if you would like to make the chat function at the bottom right hand corner of your screens bigger, then please press the arrows in the top right hand corner of the attendee list and speaker list to minimize them, making them slightly smaller. So brilliant. Let's have a look then at today's speakers. Um, so during the live share session today, we'll be joined by a number of experts from across the industry. These include Councillor Alistair Michael Moss, Deputy for the Ward of Cheap at the City of London Corporation, uh, Matthew Dillon, Associate Director at Arup, Susanna Wilkes, Director here at Cross River Partnership, uh, Rachel Aldridge, a Project Officer here at CRP, and then also myself, CRP. Uh, we'll also be joined by Star Friedman, uh, Project Officer here at Crossroad Partnership, and she'll be moderating the chat facility uh, on the right hand side of your screens. And I'll come back to that feature in just a moment. And also Joshua West will be our tech lead for the session. So during today's live show session, we'll firstly provide you with a brief introduction to CRP in addition to some of the projects we work on. I will then move over to a video recording of Councillor Alistair Michael Moss, as he's unfortunately unable to join us in person today. Uh, but Councillor Moss will talk more about the City of London Corporation's vision uh, for London centres. We'll then be joined by uh, Matthew Dillon uh, from Arup, uh, who will talk about uh, the Central Activity Zone, or the CAS, and their economic futures research. And last but by no means least, we'll then be joined by our very own uh, Rachel Aldridge, who will talk more about the roles for London centres. During the live share session, there will be a chance for you to have your say via a Q&A session after each presentation. As I've mentioned, staff will be moderating the chat facility to the right-hand side of your screen, so please do ask your questions in there. Um, during each presentation, stating your name and where you're from. We will try our very best to answer all of your questions, but if we are unable to due to time constraints, then please do contact us via email and we'll get back to you the response. Our email addresses will be displayed at the very end of the session. So what we'd like to do now is just pose a question to you, the audience. Um, and that question being, what amenities have been essential to you this year? So thinking about your local shops, pharmacy, GP surgery, leisure centres and so on. Uh, throughout the pandemic, um, which of these particular amenities were essential to you? Um, and were they accessible to you by foot or by bike within about 15 minutes of your home? Um, so yeah. Post your uh, comments or answers in the chat. Uh, would be great to hear a little bit more uh, on that. So brilliant then. Um, that wraps up all the housekeeping. Uh, and let's make a start with the session. So I'd now like to hand you all over to Susanna Wilkes, uh, Director here at Crossroad Partnership. Over to you, Susanna. Thanks very much, Thomas. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for insights into the functionality and purpose of different parts of London as we start to try to plan a successful, green and healthy recovery from COVID. Cross River Partnerships extremely pleased to be contributing to these plans, 
formed 26 years ago to build the Millennium Bridge across the River Thames, CRP is now delivering London's future together with partners from local, regional and national tiers of government, businesses and community sectors. Cross River Partnership would especially like to thank its major funders for making this live share series possible. Central Government Units DEFRA and Innovate UK's Challenge Fund, as well as the Mayor of London. This is actually the last in CRP's current series of live shares. We will be back in touch in the new year with information on our next exciting series, which will be monthly lunchtime launches. We certainly hope that you have enjoyed our live shares as much as we have. CRP's live share success has hinged largely on the unquestionable talent of our extremely fabulous chair, Thomas Joyce. Thomas will be leaving CRP at Christmas to pursue additional life passions, but we know that he will keep in touch. We thank him from the bottom of our hearts for everything he has done. So, CRP's vision is to empower people to deliver innovative projects that support places to respond well to the challenges currently being thrust upon us. This holistic approach to issues underpins London's successful planning through and out of COVID. As well as a reliable health recovery from COVID, we also want to support economic diversification and resilience instigated by COVID in ways that are good for the environment and air quality so that we are not inadvertently worsening the wider climate crisis. All of this is possible and transport definitely has a vital and intrinsic role to play. In order to show the strategic approaches that are being taken at the very centre of London by the City of London Corporation, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce a short video in two parts from Councillor Alistair Moss, Deputy for the Ward of Cheap. Um, so our response uh, to COVID-19, um, as I said, you know, this has brought significant changes to all of our lives, um, some good, some bad. Um, and the reality is for financial and professional services, most of the city has shown itself to be very resilient and to be uh, quickly adapting and, and thriving. I mean, in my law firm, for example, we were working remotely a week before lockdown and there was continuation of service so you know it's it, they've shown great resilience now of course that does call into question I'll come on to this the use of space and how we interact and things but that's the kind of the, the kind of headline figure um, and uh, the sector has had a role in developing solutions um, uh, in terms of like how we've kind of um, how we've dealt with this um, over the over this period and um, you know, there are obviously some, some businesses which are far more reliant upon footfall and interaction than there are others. Uh, there are also others, I think it's fair to say, who there are more concerns from a perspective um, as to how they can operate remotely as opposed to working in the kind of normal um, office um, environment. And of course, our focus has been on uh, supporting people in the city, uh, employees, businesses in the financial system. Uh, it's about sustaining uh, that work in terms of our uh, long-term competitiveness um, and securing uh, long-term needs on things like climate action and other things, and also uh, speeding that recovery. Uh, so uh, when we are ready to relaunch into a full and stronger economy, we're really set up to do that. And um, one thing, uh, a theme which is pervading now, I'd say, in terms of policy from the City Corporation, is that we are very sure about uh, where we're going. Uh, we're very confident about uh, the future. Um, we have plans, as you'll hear, as to where we're going, which um, 
we want to hear from you on and have heard from you on. And we view the COVID-19 pandemic, yes, as a bit of a gear change, but realistically, the same challenges and opportunities are still out there. And we are, we are hopping pursuing them. Um, in terms of our support for businesses, because we do recognize, of course, we do need to keep the show on the road and some businesses need more support for others. Um, we are obviously a major landowner. We own around a quarter of the city. I had the privilege a few years ago of chairing the city's uh, property fund. Uh, so we've done uh, the things that responsible landlords uh, would have done by changing rental payments to monthly, deferring um, uh, rent for those who are struggling, uh, writing off interest, for example. Um, our charitable arm, the City Bridge Trust, um, we've given 170 small charities in London £15,000 each to support them through COVID-19. That is a charity, by the way, that gives around £20 million a year uh, to London charities across, across London. And that trust also gave uh, £5 million to the Coronavirus Emergency Fund uh, called London Community Response uh, to help uh, charitable community and social organisations across the capital um, uh, up to £6 million. So, um, that's how we've been supporting uh, businesses throughout, as well as all the usual kind of advice on rates, transportation issues and others, which I'll touch on. Um, we, in terms of where my involvement is in terms of transportation, we've implemented a whole range of measures to ensure that people can confidently return to the city. We've seen levels around 20% or so. I hope most of you have been into the city, uh, if you can and feel confident to do so. And it, and, I've been clear that you know we 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 can't be the weak link in terms of how um, people will interact with the city and come back. So there are obviously really three stages to this. There's the transportation side to the to the city. There's the city itself in terms of walking and cycling predominantly, and then there is the COVID secure offices and uh, premises um, that comprise our food and beverage offer, etc. Transport recovery plan where. Um, in a nutshell, we've prioritised space for pedestrians and cycling um, and where people are allowed to socially distance and can socially distance. Um, and we've re reallocated space to walking and cycling with pedestrian priority streets, limited access to motor vehicles, and we've closed some streets, like Cheapside, for example, to through traffic, except in some cases for buses and people cycling. Um, so, you know, that, that has been a, a shift. But going to what I was saying a few minutes ago, we have plans to do that in terms of pedestrian priority streets were on the stock, so to speak, before, um, before the beginning of this calendar year. So we've accelerated our transport uh, strategy plan as a result of the uh, pandemic as part of this bring back better and also about, say, making people feel secure. Um, we're working with Southwark and Camden, uh, running a COVID compliant accreditation scheme. Uh, which is, uh, I think, the, told the first uh, that's been launched by local government. Um, and uh, we're also um, and, uh, 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 now, as you've probably seen around with environmental health, um, certifying places to be COVID compliant. Um, and I should say here, um, I think it you know, should be recognised by national policymakers, the huge investment that has been made in public and private money in making uh, food and leisure uh, and gym and other uses COVID secure, a huge amount of money spent in offices, um, equally uh, money spent on the highways in terms of our, um, our measures, and you'd have seen those across London, and those for those of you who are outside of London, outside of London as well, particularly around schools and transport hubs and things, um, and indeed on the national rail and uh, regional um, transport network again uh, a large amount of money has been spent there in terms of the investment secure um, moving on to the city plan 2036 which Alistair talked about <clears throat> um, we're seeking to future-proof the city through this for the next generation of our workers and residents and visitors um, uh, the aspirations of it in it are in a nutshell high quality architecture public realm sustainable transport environment and world-class visitors, residents and workers. Um, and we're ambitious in it for the next 20 years. 
and we think it's flexible enough for us to meet medium and long-term challenges posed by COVID-19. Um, and some of those um, uh, features are more flexible office space uh, to meet changing demand, urban greening, prioritizing the needs of uh, pedestrians in line with the transport strategy, uh, freight consolidation, uh, where we think the city should be run like a factory and that nothing should come in and out, ideally by way of goods, uh, which isn't controlled and smartly delivered, mainly of course to reduce uh, air pollution and traffic, and also to complement office space um, in terms of commercial and cultural retail growth. Um, and following the recent change of the use classes order, we need to build in climate action uh, targets. Statutory consultation on that will be around January and March 2021. And then we should be with Secretary of State around June for that. Uh, so, um, so I'll be happy to take questions on that going forward <clears throat> uh, and uh, to see uh, you know, where, that, where that all goes to. Um, do too much talking here. I'm needing to uh, drink. But um, transport strategy is something a piece of work we're very, very proud of, and the city plan uh, is aligned uh, uh, with that in terms of our other key strategies, such as the climate action strategy, which I'll come on to, and our transport strategy. That's twenty-five year plan. There, um, I've already talked about the prioritising of people walking, making the streets safer, etc. Having efficient and effective use of street space and making cycling easier, improving air quality and also reducing noise and improving transport and um, getting to a vision zero really in a city where we eliminate um, road casualties on the city on the streets, um, which should, I think, be a, um, an imperative for any local authority. Um, also, we've been working and I alluded to this earlier with TfL and the and national government on um, making sure that there's confidence in public transport um, and encouraging responsible use of those modes of transport uh, so that people can come into the city where it's um, important that they do so, where it's necessary for them to do so in the office environment. Um, and of course, it, it would be remiss of me not to mention the fact that we recognise that uh, TfL is under extreme pressure at the moment as a transport authority and we're doing what we can to support them but equally there are some great things in the pipeline like the Elizabeth line opening which will have will simply transform areas like Farringdon Smithfield where we will be privileged on the city boundaries with uh, with Smithfield to basically be what I'm calling the new centre of London with its transport nodes to virtually all the major airports and around, I think it's 200 train movements an hour from that station. So that will become a real uh, hub uh, for London, which we're privileged to have on our doorstep. Final point is on the uh, climate action strategy. Um, we, um, a lot of local authorities uh, declared a climate emergency. Um, we kind of stepped back and kind of thought, really we want to do something where we research first and then come up with tangible uh, solutions and a plan it's not to criticize others who have spoken first and then worked out but we felt we should do it the other way around and um, we are um, we are investing the corporation 68 million pounds over the years to tackling climate change um, that will see by way of example, the creation of 800 green jobs. Um, we will be changing our city planning regulations to ensure uh, carbon reduction designs and more sustainable designs, like, for example, the green roofs and walls that I uh, talked about, to dedicating even more space to walking and cycling, new parks, time closures, and also future proofing the city with things like flood and heat. Um, you may be aware of the fact that we are now in terms of we now have policies which are advancing quite advanced on wind mitigation but also we can map and we know where areas of the city are too hot too cold where the wind etc is an issue so we're very attuned to becoming far more advanced about 
the experience of the city, so to speak. Um, part of this strategy is that we've committed to achieving net zero emissions in our own operations by 2027, uh, which is very ambitious, and uh, across all our investments and supply chain by 2040, and also for the city as a whole to be uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2040. Um, and we feel very strongly that this is a major draw for the city and one we can't afford not, not to be pursuing. Hi everyone, I'll just jump in while we're waiting for Thomas. Um, so that was really interesting to hear from Alistair Moss of the City of London Corporation. What I'd like to do at this point without further ado is now to hand over to Matthew Dillon from Arup. But actually, um, I was going to pick up on a couple of things that Alistair said in his speech. Um, one being that he mentioned that uh, the City of London would be facing uh, very similar challenges and opportunities post-COVID, which I think reads across into our study significantly. And secondly, that an aim of his work is to make the city world class for those three groups of visitors residents and workers and certainly that's a shared aim of the piece of work uh, that we're doing for the GLA. Um, so my name is Matt Dillon and I'm an Associate Director in Arup's City Economics team here in London and we at Arup are working alongside the London School of Economics and Gerald Eve who will provide um, academic and real estate expertise to this study respectively. Um, Arup as a company um, have done a range of studies of uh, this type in the last few months um, reacting to um, the measures that have come in from COVID. So we've just completed a piece of work on the impacts of the absence of London's office workers for the central London business improvement districts. Um, we did a piece of work that culminated in late summer looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on the West End arts and culture sector and we've also done a separate piece of work looking at the impacts of COVID-19 on the central London property sector and we're really going to take those lessons and apply them to this piece of work that we're starting off right now. Um, but first back to the the CAS, um, the Central Activities Zone um, as an entity um, and I guess as everyone on this call knows that the CAS has really been a driving factor in London's economic su success story in the past 20 years. Um, it's made up of very distinct areas so for example we've got the City of London with its dominant financial sector, uh, we've got Tech City with an abundance of high value startups. Uh, we've got Canary Wharf and the Northern Isle of Dogs which uh, actually produces the highest levels of GVA per worker in the country um, and of course we've got the West End with its globally renowned cultural institutions and retail and office space um, and all of this is positioned alongside the home of the UK government at West Westminster. Um, and although the CAS has a reputation for white collar work, um, it's also a fantastic place to build a career uh, for people leaving education without many qualifications. And I'll come on to that uh, in more detail as we focus on the impacts. But further to that, the CAS is not just a great place to work, but it's also an attractive leisure destination. Um, and in recent decades, this has led to a symbiotic relationship that's uh, has meant that companies and individuals from around the world have relocated to London due to the quality of both the professional and the cultural opportunities on offer. I was really interested actually to see a blog released by our um, collaborators, uh, LSE this morning that suggested that actually it is these uh, leisure opportunities and cultural opportunities that have led to the success of cities in the last 20 years, much more so than the work opportunities, which is extremely interesting. And alongside those cultural and work opportunities, the CAS is also home uh, to around 300,000 residents. 
And although housing affordability, air quality and congestion have remained significant problems, um, the CAS has been this success story in the last 20 years, right up until uh, the period of spring 2019. And of course, since the COVID-19 pandemic, the recovery in footfall from that initial lockdown and the subsequent restrictions has been much behind other towns and cities in the UK and around the world. And that is having a significant impact on the wider economy. And in this study, we look in detail at the extent to which um, central London's loss has been, at least partially or stands to be, uh, the rest of London's gain. Um, because many local businesses closer to residential areas are thriving and it may be possible to at least partially recreate central London's agglomeration in the suburbs through home working and through cooled working environments. However, as a tonic to that, I think it's worth noting that the CAS is unique in its density of employment, which is partially due to those really high levels of public transport accessibility and connectivity, which are not replicated anywhere else in the UK um, and uh, indeed overseas. And those anchor institutions such as the art galleries, um, the universities, um, the cultural venues, the hospitals that really support that ecosystem between the leisure industry, uh, tourism, uh, office work and other reasons to visit. And of course, less leisure travel overall will mean a loss of UK exports and jobs and fewer people will be able to access world class art collections and cultural institutions. Um, but despite what you read in the papers um, about prospects for our cities, um, my view is that the outcomes need not be dismal. And actually a key part of this work is looking at the policy interventions that will take us through to a more prosperous future, which will harness some of these positive aspects of COVID-19, um, some of which Alistair touched on a moment ago and which I'll elaborate a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, so I'm just going to go on to the next slide if I can get this to work. Um, so here we um, have the um, Arab team that are working on the piece of work. Uh, the bulk of the work is going to be done by us and we've got oversight from an ex-deputy uh, director of regeneration at the GLA. Um, Professor Tony Travers of uh, the London School of Economics will provide insight on agglomeration and productivity um, and towards the right hand side of that chart on the top corner you can also see Tony's colleague Professor Neil Lee who will provide expert oversight on sectoral composition and employment. We also have Annette Mees um, who is head of audience labs at the Royal Opera House who will provide uh, input on people and culture and alongside the Arab team and the expert review panel, um, we've got colleagues from Gerald Eve who'll be looking in detail at real estate and office trends. So I'm just gonna go on to the next slide now, which details, hopefully it's a resolution that people can see um, the work that we're going to carry out. And so if we just start over towards the left-hand side of that, slide our work is split into two phases and so phase one um, is uh, between now and the end of January um, and phase two um, starts uh, sometime in mid-January so overlaps very slightly with phase one and continues until the middle of March and within phase one, there are three work streams. So there's uh, office use trends, how the CAS functions interact with one another and a focus on outer London. And on the office use trends, um, we're going to look at what the key trends in office use are coming out of COVID-19. So both within the CAS and within other uh, London locations um, that we can identify as, um, as potential uh, areas that will be able to absorb um, some more growth. We'll look at the trends before COVID-19 and we'll look at what the potential behaviour is after COVID-19. So what will happen to office-based real estate um, if office 
uh, real estate is reduced by companies, how quickly others might come onto the market to fill vacancies, and whether those uh, fillers of vacancies might have a different makeup to the companies and organizations that do uh, move aside. So we'll have a supply side analysis of company behavior. Um, we'll also look at the demand side from the white collar worker perspective. So what are the plans of individual workers? And we'll look at the behavioral aspects that are in those plans. So for example, some entrenched habits that might have formed as a result of this sustained working from home period. Um, we'll look at the impact of things like a, a lack of surety on, on people's season ticket purchases and, and in turn, how that might affect people's propensity to visit the CAS at weekends. And we'll importantly look at the uh, the role of the fear of missing out. And it's, it's fair to say now that I think um, where we are at the moment, um, there is little fear of missing out either from work experiences or from leisure experiences. And that fear of missing out has sort of characterized so many aspects of city life over the past 20 years. And my own theory is that once that fear of missing out of, of work opportunity is a water cooler conversations and we see colleagues within an office environment uh, and a similar um, uh, undertaking is made for leisure um, once concerts, restaurants and theatres start to return, then we'll see people begin to uh, return en masse. The second work stream sort of moving down the left hand side is on how white collar workers interact with the rest of the CAS. And we'll focus here on, on, on white collar workers, but also sectors with lower paid workers and look at the extent to which these are driven by tourism, um, which is also a key driver of footfall in the CAS and by other factors such as Brexit and growing digitalization over the next 10 years. So we'll look at the food and beverage sector, hotels, and we'll have a, a bit of breakout text and focus on the nighttime economy. Um, looking at those recent trends in consumer spending, uh, but also looking at long-term trends and the extent to which that spending is driven by both office workers and inbound tourism. Um, within this, we'll, we'll investigate the role of those large institutions, which are a bit less movable, um, and we'll place emphasis on that key relationship between work and leisure and this part of our work will conclude with a SWOT analysis where we'll look at the strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats of the CAS. Then finally um, in phase one we'll look at the interaction between the CAS and, and outer London so um, whether the two uh, areas uh, fortunes tend to rise and fall so how quickly do these areas tend to recover from shock and what lessons from history have we got here you know so for example how long after 2008 did central London take to recover how long did outer London take to recover and really looking at how much outer London has to gain um, from uh, any decreases in the CAS or conversely whether the two's fortunes uh, can rise and fall together and this is all building up to a question of whether it's possible to recreate some of that buzz of the CAS in outer London and we've got a focus group um, for each of those work streams. Um, I'm going to move quickly on to phase two here because I think I've probably got about five minutes left on the timer um, now um, between January and March, we're going to develop three different scenarios based on that, um, uh, that baselining work, which will help us develop projections for employment and activity in each sector for the CAS and for inner and outer London. Now, these scenarios are still in discussion. And of course, you know, everything can change in COVID world at the moment. But broadly speaking, we've, we, we've got them down to three um, three separate themes. The first one is CAS um, returning to a business as near normal. So CAS emerging successful from COVID, um, which will have a perhaps slightly less frequent visits by white collar workers uh, for those major employers, but perhaps an increase in the number of small firms taking their place, new enterprises stepping into the freed up workspaces, and an overall strengthening of London's role as a global city. The second scenario that we're looking at is something that we've 
called now a 15 minute city um, which we would suggest would lead to a lower number of office workers in the cars potentially a host of satellite offices in outer london but with a return of international tourists and so longer term market forces pointing towards a focus on residential and leisure facilities within the cars with more work taken at taking place outside of the cars then the third scenario which is perhaps the most pessimistic of those is something that we're calling at the moment the end of the urban age so that's a significant change in the way that residents businesses and organizations in the cas behave following covid19 um, brexit not ending particularly well um, and this resulting in a slight hollowing out of the central area which is similar but perhaps on a slightly less widespread scale to that which was seen in new york and in london in the 70s and 80s and we'll do projections for each of those scenario uh, for the short term so that's not to two years the medium term that's two to five years and the long term five to ten years so um, we're not focusing on this immediate survival phase our work is really looking at that recovery phase from two years hence and hopefully into a phase when london is thriving again um, and we'll work with the GLA and others in a series of policy workshops to determine the policy responses to these uh, on the themes of transport, planning and people and culture. And we're also planning some global insights uh, workshops as well. So we've already spoken with uh, colleagues in the New York mayor's office and uh, making contact to those in Singapore and other cities. Um, I'm going to very quickly go through the rest of the slides now just for the sake of time but this is a summary of the work that we're doing and here is our program plan um, so we've got the bulk of the work um, taking place in that sort of green area to the top and that the, the gray black area is Christmas uh, but you can see that already um, despite only being up and running for a few weeks um, we are um, expecting to uh, deliver our first uh, pieces of work to the GLA towards the end of January and then we've got the final piece of work coming in in March and um, I I think that's um, probably pretty much all that I have to say on that. Um, apart from to say, I guess it's worth knowing that the pandemic itself may change over this period. Um, but with the good news about the vaccine in recent weeks, uh, by March, hopefully we should be coming towards the beginning of the end of the pandemic and we should have a much clearer a picture on the range of possible futures that we'll be able to bring into the discussion. And indeed, if anyone um, listening to this uh, is interested in uh, further discussion or if they've got pieces of information that might be really helpful to us, particularly on that piece about interaction between inner and outer London um, and the relationship between the two, um, then that would be extremely helpful. And I will put my email address in the chat box. Uh, but for now, I think I'm going to hand back over to Thomas. Thank you very much, everyone. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, it's a great insight there into, into the work that you're doing at Arup. Um, brilliant. So we've got time for probably just, well, we've got one minute left of time, Matt, <laughs> because apologies for our technical difficulties at the beginning. Um, but maybe just a quick question then uh, to you just about looking at the different centres across London. Um, how do you think that these different centres can support each other in terms of their future functions moving forward? So, so do you think there'll be something like a symbolic relationship between them? Um, how, 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 well, how can they work to support each other? Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think, can you still hear me, by the way? Yes, yes, we can hear oh, you. Fantastic. OK, um, so um, I think, I mean, clearly um, we are looking at a change in um, the central activity zone and, and actually um, the extent to that which that change happens, I think, is the, the thing that's up for debate at the moment. Um, if we look at how past crises such as 2008 have affected the central area versus the outer area, we can see that uh, central London has been 
quickest to recover from economic shocks. And indeed, in the last few years, the growth of central London in terms of, you know, most of the economic indicators has outpaced um, that of the rest of London and that of the UK as a whole. So if we're looking towards that sort of recovery, um, but the centre perhaps taking on more of a role for occasional travel to work, but potentially reaching a much larger labour market at the same time, it feels to me like the centres can really support one another uh, by beginning to fulfil um, those new roles. So I think we are we are perhaps looking at a reallocation of, of, of floor space within the central area. I think we are looking at um, a degree of maintenance of localism and potentially um, uh, less um, less worse fortunes for local high streets than I think we were expecting in, in an age where more people were going to go online. Um, but the real opportunities, I think, for, for, for all of the centres are in those growing fields that were growing before COVID and are probably going to come back stronger than ever before COVID. So that's in things like hospitality, it's in things like life sciences, um, it's if if we work can sort of sort their finances out and it's it's in things like shared workspaces and it's sort of gearing um, um, gearing aspects such as planning um, policy um, ability to access through um, active travel um, modes um, and indeed building on some of these behavioral aspects such as making it simple for people um, to simply step out their door and do these things in front of them, that I think the centres can really work best together and can really create a picture that embraces these areas of growth um, and perhaps moves us on a little bit more from some of the sectors that were slightly dying out before COVID and unfortunately have been given a bit of a helping hand over the edge by the pandemic. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah, a, a great answer there. Um, so what we'll now do is, just in the interest of time, uh, we'll head on over to uh, Rachel. But Matt, do do hang on because we will have a final discussion uh, just just after Rachel's presentation. Um, but thank you very much, Matt, for a great presentation there. Brilliant. Then, so we'll now move over to Rachel Aldridge from Crossrail Partnership, uh, who'll be talking more about the roles of London centres and some of the research that CRP is undertaking undertaking to further understand the future roles that London centres can play. Um, so, across to you, Rachel. Thank you, Thomas, um, and thank you to Alistair from the City of London Corporation who we've had on the call today, and also Matt, um, who we've heard about from um, Arab and their exciting study with the GLA, as well as. Um, LSC and Geraldine and I'm really pleased to be speaking at the, the last live share in CRP's series of 16 um, and throughout the series we've had some really great initiatives from speakers and comments in the audience listening in so thank you. Um, today I'm going to be talking about CRP's exciting new research project into the roles for London centres um, the need for this research as well as the imperative for air quality and all of this um, as London emerges from the coronavirus pandemic. So as Matt mentioned from a CAS context, we're all aware of the major changes um, our city has experienced over the past nine months. And it's clear the way in which London's going to function in the future won't mirror how it's functioned in the past, um, especially given the fact that London has reached tier three status as of yesterday. So back in March, globalization took a hit because our worlds became so much smaller, um, which has led to the resurgence of the 15 minute city concept a vision where we um, where work, home, shops and entertainment should all be accessible within the same time we might have once waited for our daily commute. But there's now an undeniable relationship between citizens and the rhythm of life in our city centres, um, which has created a new vision and ambition to set our sights for London's future, which will be a post-COVID, post-Brexit world. And London has a vast potential to harness the opportunity um, that a post-pandemic was created. So an opportunity for higher footfall, improvement of our centres and a change to transition towards a green recovery um, and a heightened view on sustainability as well. So all in, this is an extremely timely opportunity for London's decision-making organisations to work together to implement practical solutions 
to the issues regarding footfall in London's centres. So before I go into some more detail about the CRP study, um, it's important to point out there are many other relevant studies completed or underway, for example, the research into the CAS um, with the GLA that Matt's spoken about today. So we'll be adding to this GLA Arab study and we're liaising fully with the GLA on an ongoing basis so that our studies continue to cross-reference and support one another. And we're looking to build on each of these studies on this slide um, on research which will complement what's already out there or underway. And I think Star's posting um, links to these relevant resources as well. So just for a bit of context, as classified by the London plan, um, there are 221 centres, and obviously London's high streets are a key component of these centres. British city centres overall take up just half the area of the Isle of Wight, so um, quite a small geographical area, but they're home to 8% of British businesses, which really emphasises the importance that centres play in the national economy. And tracking how people have started to use these centres again since the first lifting of lockdown in June shows such a divergence in the way that different sized city centres have bounced back. So small and medium sized centres outside of London have seen stronger recoveries um, with non-essential shops, pubs, restaurants arriving back, obviously before their tier system. Um, and by September, average footfall was kind of equal or above pre-lockdown cities. Um, but London tells a different story, which Matt detailed earlier in the session, and the rise in footfall post lockdown has been less obvious. So, much less of a change. We might feel as if we've kind of retreated into a digital world over the past few months. Um, it's just 16% of London's army of office workers who are spending money in shops, cafes, bars have returned to their place of work. So, that's around 1.5 million fewer workers coming into central London. And early finds from the Labour Force survey suggest that the number of um, non-UK nationals in work in London has declined sharply with the majority departing for overseas um, and these workers make up 25% of London's employees. Um, but research from the Centre for Cities has shown that the UK economy has been concentrated in its city centres since the late 90s and this greater concentration has been at the heart um, of the boom that a large um, a number of large city centres have experienced. So this definitely shows that certain types of businesses are willing to pay a premium for face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and we want to work together to create new opportunities to help the city and its centres come back with sustainable, resilient, green recovery that reflects the cultural and business offer of central London um, as the pandemic evolves and hopefully expires with the positive news of the vaccine. So CRP will be building on and complementing other pieces of work um, with the new research project we're commissioning into the roles for London centres to show how these centres can work together to create a successful future for themselves in really practical ways. And our report will lay out recommendations on transport, economic, environmental and health aspects of London's futures to show how the powerful players in London should act now in terms of placemaking, landowning and business. Um, to create opportunities for, Lon for London to function in a different way in the future. And we all know that London has an enormous value based on collaboration and innovation. So this study will bring together partners from across London to really emphasise this. And we're really interested in the interplay between the different centres across the central London subregion, as well as how that sits within the greater London as a whole. Um, and there's been a resurgence in supporting small local businesses that's emerged during the pandemic. And we'd really like to explore how this can be captured in longer term to bolster the role and importance of local centres. So the third point in there shows our study will result in practical recommendations um, for bodies, including the GLA, local authorities, um, bids and landowners. And this will be in the form of short term. So that's April 2021 to March 2022. Um, medium term, which is 2022 to 2025, and longer term, which is up to 2030. Um, so these recommendations will be um, for realistic implementation. Again, the emphasis is on practical recommendations. And this slide is just a quick timeline of CLP study. We're currently at number three on the scale, um, evaluating the excellent submissions we received. And we're currently in the final stages of the procurement process. 
So as can be seen by section one on the diagram, we liaise with the CRP board and the Central London Sub-Regional Transport Partnership Group to finalise the tender specification, um, which is going to make this study particularly unique. And we also went out to pre-identified organisations to undertake the project study. And of course, air quality is at the heart of the reason for change and the imperative for London centres to adapt to these changing times. Um, so according to CBI Economics, dirty air in the UK causes 3 million working days to be lost every year, owing to people getting ill or taking time off to care for sick children. And air pollution has been a focus of several studies on cognitive impairment and dementia risk. Um, there's evidence that tiny air pollution particles can enter the brain and there's a strong case for further research into the effect of air pollution on brain health. And new research also suggests that living in areas with high pollution, such as London centres, um, worsens your memory to the same extent as ageing 10 years. So a correspondent from the University of Warwick says something that really stuck with me. Um, the effect was strong and worrying when it comes to remembering a string of words a 50-year-old in polluted Chelsea performs like a 60-year-old who lives in relatively unpolluted Plymouth. So action on air pollution benefits the bottom line um, as well as um, employee health. And with the forthcoming environmental bill, um, the government has an opportunity to show its level of ambition. So, yeah, just overall, at a time where air pollution is associated with an increase in COVID deaths as well, and the economic rationale for reducing air pollution is well proven, um, action on this issue has never been more important. And London centres have a great capacity to become cleaner villages um, and improve local air quality through thorough recommendations. So just overall then, COVID's provided the opportunity for change to economic activity, public transport, hospitality and the arts, um, whilst creating a green and cleaner recovery from COVID, avoiding a more congested and polluted recovery. We want the centre to function better, a space for more active travel, better air quality and more comfortable spaces. Um, and we're really excited to be building on existing studies and complementing this with new research from CRP into the roles for London centres moving forward. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Rachel. Some staggering stats there um, regarding air quality. Um, we've got time for about, well, we've got about 30 seconds, Rachel, just for a, just for a quick Q&A. And maybe within those 30 seconds, would you be able to maybe elaborate slightly on why you think transport is applicable uh, to the roles of London centres? Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, the lockdowns we've had have hugely impacted London's transport system. It's really shifted the way we use transport, impacting on like patterns and you know the associated um, economic activity with transport. So, and there's still um, a tension between kind of the role of the high street as a destination and a place for movement of people. So, I think obviously transport is essential to the way we navigate our city, and it's vital that we look at it um, in this report. Um, and we'll kind of delve into recommendations based on the impact COVID's had on travel habits across the city. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, yes, great presentation there, and thank you for answering the questions as well. Um, so in the interest of time then, uh, what we'll do is we'll just uh, pose a final observational discussion question then for all of our speakers today, um, within the two minutes that's remaining, uh, so about 30 seconds each. Um, and we're going to reverse, reverse order, sorry, of those who presented. Um, but what would be on your checklist for a successful 15-minute city? So I know a lot has been said uh, throughout today's live share regarding 15-minute cities. What would be on your checklist to make those uh, those cities successful? So we'll start with you, Rachel. Well, thanks, Thomas. Um, I think keeping it nice and short, I think an environmentally sustainable um, 15 minute city as well as commercially sustainable so integrated transport links low levels of local air pollution um and yeah thriving like business hubs and centers within those 15 minutes brilliant thank you rachel across to you matt um thanks thomas well what a what an incredible question um like rachel i'd say um we need a sustainable transport network um 
completely agree with her presentation about COVID bringing into sharper focus the issues that we have with air uh, pollution in London, which needs to be a priority uh, for when we recover. Um, I will be a bit naughty and will also say that I believe that a good 15 minute city is one that gives people access to opportunities beyond that 15 minute sphere. So having those uh, cross London and interregional links to give people access to these really world class um, opportunities that might exist a bit further than 15 minutes away is key. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. Um, and finally, across to you then, Susanna. Yeah, I think that the 15 minute city uh, centres need to provide safe and meaningful places for real human connections, as well as the more tangible convenience goods and services being provided. We need to be creating places for people to just be as well as to do. Brilliant. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you to uh, Matt and Rachel as well. So there we go then. Finally, before you all leave to go about the rest uh, of your afternoons, I would like to remind you all to sign up to our newsletter and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn to receive all of our latest updates here at CRP. Uh, this live share, past live shares, uh, and any future live shares that we may do for that matter will be posted on our YouTube channel for you to view whenever you want and also to share with whoever you want. Any questions you have, as always, please do not hesitate to get in contact with any one of us. Our contact details are on your screens now. And finally, then, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today for some really thought-provoking and insightful presentations. And a big thank you to everyone for tuning in and joining us this afternoon for our final live share of the series. Um, it's been brilliant to see so many of you tuning in over the last six months, and we hope that you found these sessions useful. On behalf of the whole CRP team, whatever it is you're getting up to this festive period, we hope you have a wonderful break. Remember to stay safe uh, and we'll see you all again in the new year. Goodbye.